Tom Moore covers the 76ers, Calkins Media, and a lot of Sixers news just about a week away, Tom, from the NBA draft. We thank you, as always, for jumping on board, and it seems like there's a lot going on with this team. A lot of workouts in here, and uh, I'll ask you, leading up to the workouts, no Simmons, and uh, it seems like some people think that's a big deal. I don't really look at it as much of a big deal. The last three years, they drafted a guy they never saw. Uh, so Simmons will not work out for them or anybody else. Is that correct? That's what we're hearing. I mean, you would think if he's going to work out for anybody, it'd be the Sixers and the Lakers who are one and two, who logically would be the only teams, you know, that would have the possibility to draft them. Um, they're counting and relying a lot on, you know, Brett Brown, you know, having coached his father, having known him since he was born. He coached, he coached uh, Simmons' father over in the early 90s in um, Australia in Melbourne. So he's a, a friend of the family, and I believe Simmons' mother was a cheerleader, uh, you know, with the team. So like, he, he goes back to the beginning. He, he knew them before Ben, you know, was born. So I, I believe the Sixers are counting heavily on that in terms of his uh, relationship and also the people that he knows that know Simmons, et cetera. So I think they're kind of using that to counteract the fact that maybe you don't have as much information as you'd like um, in terms of whether even it's just a, getting together for a meal or, you know, a couple hours in the afternoon to chat or whatever. Tom, uh, this morning I was brushing up on my Croatian, and I was reading the uh, Sporto V over there, which said Dario Saric, 99 posto idiom you Philadelphia Jew. It sounds like in my Croatian that that sounds 99% I'm coming to Philadelphia. Is that how you read it? Well, I mean, that's, I believe that's what that's what he's saying there. But, you know, uh, Brian Colangelo talked, the, I guess, Monday with Irving in, uh, excuse me, Ingram in, and he said he, you know, their Sixers are hopeful that he'll come here and he'll, uh, you know, he's he believes that, you know, uh, that Sarge would like to play here, but that, that there is a buyout. And as I understand it, the Sixers can only pay a certain amount of that buyout. So his team in Turkey in Istanbul, Anadolu Efes, E-F-E-S, they would have to agree to let him go, whether they would have to waive some of that money or work it out some other way. But there's an NBA rule limiting how much you can pay, and I believe the Sixers cannot pay the full amount of the buyout. So I don't know if that's what Brian Colangelo and others wonder, because um, he said he was kind of neither optimistic nor pessimistic mm -hmm. after meeting with Sarge, you know, with Brett Brown, um, you know, whatever that was two weeks ago, uh, uh, ten days ago, whatever it was. So uh, I don't know. I mean, it's one of those things you, you, you don't, won't believe it. That the key date is July seventeenth. That's the day he's got a. That's the deadline for him informing his team um, uh, over there if he'll be back for a third year or if he's you know leaving his contract. So you're talking about another five weeks, I guess. So, you know, between now and then, you know, should know what, what happens. Right. There's been a lot of, you know, rumblings that it looks like he's coming over. And then, you know, but I, I would say, yeah, you're hopeful, but you just never know until all it needs is one thing to be a snafu. And, you know, financially, he could probably double his money if he stays one more year and come over here because the Sixers would have still have his rights but he wouldn't have to abide by the rookie contract. I'm not saying that's the only thing, but sometimes that is a factor. Miritich from the Bulls did that, and he ended up making like two and a half times what he would make after playing three years overseas. Yeah. So that could be a factor too. Yeah, now Colangelo spoke highly of him the other day in terms of what he saw and how much his game has uh, improved and matured since he was drafted in 2014. So, you know, because you wonder – what ties does this new front office have to Sarge, and do they like him as much as the old regime? Yeah, I mean, obviously Sam Hinkie was a big proponent, but I would say, you know, Brett Brown has been the constant, even when Brian Colangelo, you know, said, uh, oh, geez, I don't even know, maybe a month ago that he hadn't communicated with Sarge, but Brett Brown mm -hmm. had continued to, you know, text and uh, et cetera with, with him. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think they'd like to have him here, even if they draft Simmons, and some people think that Sarge and Simmons are, are similar players in that they're both facilitators, mm -hmm. initiators, not great shooters, probably natural four men, um, both 6'10". Um, but I, I think that 
you know, Colangelo will get everybody here. Everybody who's you know, and obviously Embiid being the, the biggest, the biggest of the uh, thing Sixers or the current guys under contract currently. Um, I think he would like to get everybody here and then kind of figure out what they have and what the rotation is or if they need to make some moves or whatever. Tom, uh, in a lot of workouts recently with guys that would be drafted in the uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 range, how diligently are they looking to maybe get back into that area, in your opinion? We know Okafor, Noel, those names are going to constantly be mentioned, but do they realistically have a guy that you think that they yearn for enough to get themselves back in there? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I think, and, and I don't, this is um, this is just my I don't know this, but my supposition is that they like Murray and they like Jalen Brown. Um, Brian Colangelo has, if you look at the rosters in Phoenix and more more so in um, Toronto, he really likes athletic long wings. And I think the kid, uh, Jalen Brown, who worked out for them yesterday, um, you know, defends multiple positions, really athletic, not a great shooter, but a decent shooter. Um, he's probably going to be in there. I mean, there's rumblings that Boston likes him and can take him as high as number three. And Murray, I think they like that he's young, but he can kind of, he's a two guard, but he also handles it pretty well. So he might be able to be sort of an offensive minded point guard. If you don't get a, a real point guard, you could try him there or, as a combo guy, to me, those are the two guys. If they're in that three to seven to eight range, that I would target, and that I believe that the Sixers, you know, would be most interested in, given the you know the skill sets they're looking for, and you know their roster, you know, and all the factors. Tom Moore is with us, Calkins Media here, talking to the Sixers uh, less than a week or about a week and a day away from the draft next Thursday, and uh, Tom. Uh, they announced that Joel Embiid will not play in the summer league, but that he is kind of doing some more. He's going to do some uh, controlled two on twos and three on threes. Uh, how often do you see Embiid? And I mean, are you starting to get a better understanding of where he is and and where he might be come October? I mean, Mike, he looks tremendous playing one on none and going against assistant coaches and drills. You know, his footwork and his handle and all that stuff. But it is again like one on none or one on a half, if you will, when you have assistant coach kind of, you know, putting a, giving a little bit of uh, a little bit of resistance, uh, you know, with him. And he really shoots well. He had a beautiful behind the back move, right to left uh, the other day. We got to see him, I guess, on I guess that was Monday. Um, but. You know, he's got to get to five on five. He has not played five on five. Is he doing you know? anything, though? Is he doing more on that foot? I mean, like I, we talked about a month ago, yeah. and the last time I yeah. saw him in person, I mean, he wasn't leaving that foot, but that was in December. I'm wondering how far he's come. Like, I've seen video of him dunking and landing on that foot, which is, a, I guess, yeah. is a good sign. Yeah, he, he is definitely doing more. Uh, you're right. A few months ago, he would shoot, and he wouldn't land. He would shoot, like, one-legged things with that leg in the air and come down on that foot. Well, about a month ago, he started doing some drills, not full speed, but the opposite, where he would shoot it and he would land on the foot. And every time I see him, you know, he seems to go, maybe he's like at 70% now in terms of 70, 75, how quickly he's moving and the things he's doing. Again, it's controlled. It's not a, a lot of physical stuff. He's not getting banged and knocked and jostled and all that stuff when he goes up in the air. Is he yearning he, for that? Do you think he's like like waiting to rip out and do more does he have that look of like guys I'm ready to do more I I, I mean I think so uh, we haven't been permitted to talk to him you know since September of 2014 <laughs> no so one has I, spoken I a word to this guy right none of you guys have spoken a word to him right but that's not true uh the ball he was working out the one day the ball rolled over to me I I, <laughs> I wrote back to him and he said thank you so he did speak two words to me so I, I can honestly <laughs> say that that is the truth at, at PCOM the one day. But, yeah, I think he would like to. Uh, I think he would like to talk. I think you're just afraid because, you know, if you follow his Twitter handle with the uh, Shirley Temples and all the stuff, he's a little bit of a loose cannon. I think they're a little afraid after that whole year of talking to Andrew Bynum just about every week and, you know, updates and, you know, what a, what a fiasco that was. And I think that they're a little concerned and they'd like for his on-court, um, you know, on-court performance to sort of talk more than him literally and the NBA rule is you don't have to talk until you scrimmage five on five and supposedly he has not done that hmm. um, you know as a pro and we're not aware that he's done it so he, he's up to three on three 
you know, he still has a ways to go, you know, to get there. Um, I, I, I think the best thing for him would be to play a little bit in the summer league, but if he is not physically ready and the doctors think there's still a risk that, you know, that the bone isn't fully healed, they should hold him out. I just like the idea of a transition where he gets to play against some borderline NBA guys um, uh, to, just to get a feel for what it's like as opposed to going from being a freshman at Kansas to, you know, playing against the best centers in the league and, you know, in the world um, next fall if he is healthy enough to play. I just think that's a that's a big, that's a huge jump. Uh, yeah, we're talking uh, Sixers with Tom Moore from Calkins Media, longtime Sixers beat writer here on the Sports Desk. Yesterday, uh, Alex Kennedy with uh, Basketball Insiders was on, and he did a one-on-one with uh, Okafor. And one of the questions, in fact, Okafor said in the interview that uh, he anticipates that uh, Embiid will play. But he did say that he seemed very happy in Philadelphia. He said he wants to grow, he was frustrated with the losses, but that he is happy here and he understood that he was not going to make the playoffs and win right away. Do you sense that as well, that Okafor is in good spirits, even with all the trade talk and all this stuff? He, he, you know, Do you sense that he is happy to go forward in Philadelphia if that's what his future holds? Well, I mean, I think, Mike, he knows that <laughs> it certainly can't get any worse than last year. You know, like he, he's gone th- going through 72 losses in your rookie year when you're a top three, a third pick. And to be – to full disclosure, he did at training camp say he thought the Sixers could compete for a playoff spot last year. Um, uh, You know, it's one of those things where you kind of like feel like saying, uh, you know, you're 19, uh, you should look around, get a sense. But everybody thinks that they they can make a difference, and I think that was the biggest thing, that, you know, he could score 20 points and they would lose by 15 or 20 a a lot of times. So, um, but I, yeah, I think think he's, and I think he realizes that there's going to be help uh, whether he plays or not, you know, you're going to have another high draft pick. Um, you know, let's let's say there's a 60% chance Sarge comes over. I don't know what the numbers are, but let's say slightly better than 50 50. You probably use at least one of those 24th and 26th picks for a guy who should be able to crack the rotation. Right. Maybe the other one, you pick a guy who plays in Europe for a year, or you make a trade, or, you know, you, do, you combine the two and try to move up to 16 or 17 if there's somebody you really like and, and still on the board kind of thing. But I, and, and I think. The regime, too, the Colangelo regime is not all about just young guys. They want to balance things out positionally and age-wise, so they want to bring in some guys who have played four or five years, who have a sense of what the league is like, etc. So I think he realizes that you know that they're going to be more competitive and they're going to try to win more as opposed to last year. Once Embiid was out for last year, I think Sam Hinkie pretty much said, you know, we're going to be as bad as possible and, and, and take every every shot we can get at getting that number one pick, which in the third year it worked out in that respect. Uh, he's Tom Moore, covers the 76ers, Calkins Media, and you can follow him at T Moore 76ers for more on the 76ers draft and the offseason, which should be very interesting as well. Tom, I'm sure we'll catch up th- soon. Thanks, pal. Anytime, Mike. Take care.